time to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Edwin Jacques. Maybe I will introduce a little bit of uh, my uh, background and, and scientific part of of, uh, of Emil. Uh, he did his master studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, specializing both in theoretical chemistry and in physics. Then he moved for his PhD studies to University College London, uh, where he accomplished his PhD in 2017 uh, in theoretical molecular physics. Under uh, supervision of uh, Jonathan Tennyson, then uh, followed to postdoc, uh, postdoc position, one in Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada, in quantum quantum dynamics, and then quite unexpected uh, sounding Daisy Hamburg, where Emil was working at the uh, at the molecules uh, department, and since 2022. And you joined uh, 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 what is most probably now, I would say, the most successful Polish one uh, startup, uh, Bank, which is based in Krakow, uh, working in um, quantum algorithms mainly, quantum software and quantum uh, quantum algorithms. And Emil is now there, the head of the quantum algorithms theory department, right? Yes. Okay, so today we will uh, hear um, something about the, the to topic that has been quite hot in the quantum uh, quantum technologies community, namely uh, attempts to simulate quantum chemistry with the uh, devices that we have or that we imagine having. And the round of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, could you switch off the lights? <laughs> Big thanks to uh, the organizers of today's meeting, especially to Yarek for uh, giving me a chance to talk to you today. Uh, so as you can see, the plan is to uh, have a little chat about uh, chemistry and quantum computers. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, but before that, uh, a few words about BAIT. What is BAIT? What is it? Well, BAIT is a quantum computing company. Uh, it's been founded in 2017 by three excellent ex Googlers, uh, Wojtek Burkot, uh, Polina Mazurek, and Vitor Tiarnitsky. And we've got offices in Poland, Krakow, but also Canada, in Toronto, and in the US. Uh, with about 20 employees now, uh, mathematicians, computer scientists, and physicists, uh, we've submitted more than 30 patent applications. And we've got now uh, nine granted. Uh, we also raised uh, just above ten million dollars uh, in non dilute funding and private funding as well. And here's a glimpse of our office in practice. Uh, so, if I were to summarize in one sentence what Faith is doing, I would say that uh, we are providing computing solutions to hard problems. Here it is, and. <clears throat> We know that quantum computing has to go hand in hand with classical computing, uh, at least today. So we invest in both. Uh, we have a branch of classical computing, and there's this name, Cerebras. Uh, we code uh, molecular simulations on wafer scale engines with plenty of cores, uh, around 1 million cores to do highly parallel molecular dynamics. Uh, but uh, we also go a bit down to earth with optimization problems. So we have uh, something called the Cubo solver. Cubo is a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. And this Cubo solver is available on AWS. Uh, and our guys also produce an excellent simulated annealer you might have heard about U Wave machines. So, other idea is U Wave uh, badly, I would say. So, uh, behind these engines, we develop our products, but this is not for today. Today, I'm going to talk about quantum. And uh, our quantum team has, let's say, historically three branches. One uh, is around the quantum error correction. And uh, these are the labs in, in Toronto, a very able team. Uh, today, we focus mostly on fault-tolerant quantum simulations. 
but in the past, uh, since 2017, uh, we've had a deep dive into uh, the growth research uh, and a short, uh, say, short romance with the question of boson sampling uh, and other algorithms as well. But today, it's about quantum simulation. Uh, so the plan is uh, that we're going to talk a little bit about how to calculate Hamiltonian eigenvalues to a quantum computer. Uh, then we'll ask the question how to do it, but at a lower cost. Uh, and the keywords will be symmetries and tensor network decompositions. And finally, I'll try to show, let's say, new ventures for quantum computing, I, I hope. Uh, so we try to extend the portfolio of applications, like how and where we're going to use it. And this is going to be about the polybrake Hamiltonian. Uh, so to give a little bit of context, uh, we are interested in the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay? And we would like to calculate uh, the Hamiltonian eigenvalues. And we assume that we've chosen the representation uh, so that the Hamiltonian is represented with a matrix to n to the power of n by 2 to the power of n. Uh, so we would like to pull out the eigenvalues, and you can do it with a classical computer by just by itemization, uh, or do it approximately, grid of subspace methods, or sparse matrices, etc., etc. Quantum computers work vastly different. So in order to pull out eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian with a quantum computer, uh, need to solve the simulation problem instead. You need to choose some simulation time and error threshold epsilon. And the goal is to approximate the time evolution operator with something that is quantum simulation algorithm. Uh, and you might represent this algorithm with quantum circuits uh, and quantum gates. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. But this is not limited to quantum circuit representing the quantum gates. Uh, that's the star here. So uh, that's the context. Uh, therefore, we move on to chapter one, that is uh, quantum phase estimation. So wait, a way to get the eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian. So the goal is to learn eigenvalues of a unitary operator U, uh, especially I care about this theta phase. Here. Uh, so let's do a little walkthrough uh, with one base estimation algorithm. Uh, we start with a bunch of qubits. Qubits are quantum states that can uh, be in superposition of zero and one state. Uh, and let's say we've got n such qubits here. And let's call it an estimation register. We'll be estimating eigenvalues with these qubits, like representing these values. <coughs> uh, in the bottom here, we have just an arbitrary state for now, uh, which is represented with m qubits. So we've got n plus m qubits. Let's call it a system register. So the state in the beginning is just a product of psi and zeros. So if we now apply a collection of so-called Adamard gates. And Adamard gate produces an equal superposition of zero and one. Uh, and if you apply this to all n qubits, uh, you will end up with, a, with an equal superposition of states labeled by integer index k. And you will scan all the numbers from zero to, to the power of n minus one. Uh, so we prepare the state. And what do we do next? Well, we implement our unitary operator u, and we expect that u acting on this input state returns phase times the same state, i.e. this is an eigenstate of uh, operator u. And if we assume that, uh, you also need to somehow entangle these two registers. And this little dot here means that if this qubit is in state one, execute this box here. 
Uh, so as you can see, the control is on all n qubits here. If you do this, you will eventually end up with the theta phase uh, multiplied by k, where k runs to all possible values. And this reminds us of something. Uh, well, this is unlike Fourier transform. Uh, and we would like to learn about what's, what's the value of this theta. So the natural thing to do is to apply an inverse quantum Fourier transform on these uh, estimation qubits. And if you do that formally, you'll end up with a state represented with theta. Uh, and when you have that, you can just measure the state of the qubits. And as a result, you'll get a collection of zeros and ones, a bit string. Uh, and this bit string represents an eigenvalue of u uh, up to given precision. The precision is 2 to the negative power n. So it's related to the size of this register. Uh, and this notation means that this is so called fraction, uh, binary fraction. So it's uh, smaller than one. So that's, that's the, the pipeline. And the, we, we can also interpret this quantum phase estimation uh, in the following steps to get a little bit of intuition. Uh, that first, you prepare grounds for a computation. So you set up your precision for your eigenvalue, and you, you pro pro procure an equal superposition of uh, states in the estimations register. When we have that, you take your unitary matrix or you, your operator, your eigenstate, and pull out information from these two guys about the eigenvalue corresponding to the to, to side. So you transform, sort of pull out the information into the amplitudes, I would say. Uh, and when you have that, one Fourier transform just moves information from the amplitude into the register. And when you have your information encoded in the register, uh, you just do the readout. Uh, that's, that's the pipeline uh, for quantum phase estimation. But it's quite harsh to say, it's quite restrictive to say that I need to have an eigenstate. Uh, if I knew the eigenstate, that would be already quite a lot. Uh, so, so it doesn't have to be the case for quantum phase estimation. You might take any almost arbitrary state as input, as long as uh, it's decomposable into eigenstates of U. And the state that you care about is in this, in this uh, linear combination. So the overlap of the state with your desired eigenstate is non-zero. Uh, so now you can, we can assume an arbitrary state and uh, gain for each such state in this uh, superposition U uh, acts that it multiplies the state by phase. Uh, so at the end of the computation, uh, what you're going to end up with, uh, you're going to measure a, a, a histogram, a collection of bit strings, and the probability for which eigenvalue you measure is proportional to the square modulus of this coefficient in this expansion or the overlap. So you can sum up uh, this quantum phase estimation algorithm uh, with the following words that with probability c modulus square, QPE returns an approximation to the eigenvalue theta. And I'm getting ahead now of Hamiltonian divided by some lambda up to precision to the negative n. And what you're left with on the system register is your pure eigenstate, uh, which corresponds to this eigenvalue. So, uh, so this is this is more by and large about about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, short uh, question, uh, because you made a shortcut because now you are talking about Hamiltonian, not the unitary. Yes. Right? Uh, yes. 
And the time is very important here because when you have the state, not the eigenstate, but the arbitrary state, which is a superposition, then the spaces for different eigenstates are different uh, because you make this use at different moments. And then it is not so obvious that uh, what you get is the eigenvalue with probability C of squared, as you wrote. It's, it's usually uh, smaller than that. Uh, yeah. So you're right, there's, there's a caveat to it. Uh, if uh, the eigenvalue is not representable as a binary fraction exactly, then you get the distribution of uh, bit strings here. But uh, I think this is regardless of, of the phase. Uh, so so uh, this is true only under assumption that all these use are due exactly at the same moment. You do all these years yes. at the same moment. I don't think so. Otherwise, the different types you have different phases uh, for different single states, which you do not know arbitrary. Uh, so I got the suggestion that we go to the whiteboard to us and try to figure it out because I might be wrong. And I think that's enough that this U is the actual dynamics, which is the same time for every operation. Yes, but if you yeah. don't know the eigenstates. Then you don't know the phases which are for different mm -hmm. eigenstates are, are different, right? The final state is the superposition of this lambda with different phases in the end. This is going to involve, yes, in time. Ever. So in the end, you have mm -hmm. very, very strange state. And, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I don't understand. Uh, I think because we link measurements here. Eventually, what you care about will be the square modulus. But let's let's do the bigger difference. What you mean is between the Hamiltonian exacting on this in the in quantum uh, well your your uh, your quantum computer and the difference what you want to implement over there. So this U is not the uh, unitary evolution that uh, is acting on a free state. It's something that you want to implement in this. In this because now so there is a shot of, uh, from U to H, right? So, uh, so, it was so hard I suggest I suggest we move it maybe to, yeah. to uh, discussion afterwards. Emil, I Emil is with us here today, and also tomorrow. Yeah, let's let's talk in more detail. But I think the answer might be lying here if you expand this in linear combination, and then you do project measurement on uh, the estimation register that should kill any phases. But let's let's go step by step, of course. Thanks for that. I'll, uh, uh, I'll keep it in mind then. Um, so now, just to the point, why, what we care about in phase estimation from the standpoint of quantum algorithms and their costs. Well, uh, as, as I said, we'll be trying to estimate the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonians. And one way to represent the evolution operator is through uh, an exponent of the Hamiltonian. Uh, it turns out that quantum algorithms give you uh, the exponent in this form, where lambda is the norm of the Hamiltonian. So it's the generator of the evolution divided by the norm. Uh, and this is a big issue, because you need to perform a number of repetitions of this U unitary orthogonal to lambda. So lambda is just might be a sum of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And it's vastly different from classical computing algorithms. Uh, so this sets with some energy scale. Uh, so you might summarize that the cost of these unitaries here is proportional to 2 to the power of n, which sets the precision. This is uh, denoted with 1 over epsilon here. This is just epsilon is, is our precision of our eigenvalue. So the, the bigger the precision, uh, uh, i.e., uh, the bigger uh, uh, the inverse epsilon, uh, and the, the more operations you have to do. Uh, and also, this lambda enters linearly the cost. And there's also this inverse of this overlap. Uh, uh, it's pure statistical factor here. Uh, and there's a mysterious part that's called C of D of H, which is the cost of so-called block encoding of the Hamiltonian into this unitary. I'll talk about it later. So norm, this, this L1 norm, is, is critical to uh, the overall cost of quantum algorithms. And across the community, efforts have been made in the past few years, I would say, to reduce this norm for, for 
uh, North onions. And here are some references. Sorry, can I have mm -hmm. two, two questions? Sure. So I am at the puzzle why cost of incremental controls U depends on the overlap because like it shouldn't because this, this U is just some unitary, right? Mm -hmm. And it should be mm -hmm. yeah. because it should, shouldn't depend on the You're right. I, I should say that the overall cost, uh, the overall cost <coughs> of uh, quantum phase estimation or the number of repetitions would be proportional to the inverse. Uh, ah, right. Like if you want to estimate the energy, perhaps, or something. Yes, so like, if, like an if you have, value corresponding to the specific. Yes, so if you have superposition of states, uh, eigenstates, and you want to, let's say, uh, measure a specific eigenvalue, right. it will right. be tossed down that. It's kind of mm -hmm. right. And second question like, why uh, one norm, not operate, I mean, ah. like operator norm, and maybe when you have locality, not in return, I guess. That's a brilliant question, but uh, I so so the answer I, I get is this: uh, it's the norm that comes out of the algorithm. Uh, it's it's heavily dependent on the way you block and fold your Hamiltonian. Okay. So sometimes it's a one norm, sometimes it's the operator norm, sometimes it's the nuclear norm, uh, and uh, which norm it is, uh, I, I I went a bit too specific here. And it's prompted your question. And uh, thanks. So it should be it should be just just a general norm. Uh, but in this case, I think the L1 norm uh, covers most most cases. Yes. So because for, for when you have explanation eigenvalues, you don't it will be exponential cost, right? Magnitude uh, mm -hmm. of eigenvalues. Um, Roughly the same. So every eigenvalue is bounded from above by this norm, yeah. And uh, I don't think the actual uh, magnitude of the eigenvalue will be so important here because what well, the that number of different eigenvalues is ex there are exponentially many of them, mm -hmm. right? The For number of, of different eigenvalues yeah. exponentially many. For the norm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, let's say to the power of uh, n such eigenvalues. Uh, so this norm might be huge, uh, and the, the goal is exactly to reduce this. Yes, so so to truncate, for instance, uh, and this is exactly what people have been doing uh, the past couple of years, uh, including uh, a team from Google Quantum AI. Uh, so these references, let's say, represent the state of the art. So today. And we're trying to improve on that. And here's our story. So uh, we'll be utilizing symmetries and tensor network factorizations to grow at this norm, whatever norm it is. Uh, and this work has been done by uh, our marvelous mathematician, Konrad Decker. Uh, so a lot of credit goes to him. Uh, it's a brilliant mind. And I'll just lay out what we've established. So let's set context first. Uh, let's take uh, the electronic chemotonium, which is sum of the kinetic energy of electrons, uh, nuclear electron attraction, and electron-electron repulsion. Uh, let's pick the basis, uh, so-called spin orbital basis, where uh, there are two indices. One runs from 1 to n, which represents orbitals. And the other sigma is for spin. Uh, and what we might do, we might define uh, ladder operators, create electrons given states, we obey anti commutation rules, and you might convert uh, Hamiltonian into a second quantized form uh, where there are one body operators represented with uh, there are also matrix elements for those, uh, A, P, Q, and also two body operators. And the two body operators they stem from. The electron action uh, repulsion. So we can go even a step further because uh, the electronic Hamiltonian doesn't depend on spin uh, exclusively. So what you could do, you could define uh, some, I would call it excitation operators, uh, and they are, if somebody's keen on that, they are generators of some U of 2 group. Uh, but the point is, 
that if you define an operator E through such product, you might take a trace over the spin variable and uh, express the electronic Hamiltonian with such operators, U of n generators. And the form of this Hamiltonian is, let's say, similar to uh, the second quantized form. Uh, so this is the form that we'll be working with. Uh, and now the idea behind symmetries uh, in norm reduction is that you construct a new Hamiltonian that acts exactly as the electronic Hamiltonian on the eigenvectors. This electronic Hamiltonian might be written this way. So I want to build H tilde, which satisfies this equation for eigenstates of H electronic. Once I have that, I want to parameterize this new Hamiltonian such that this norm of this new Hamiltonian is lower than the electronic Hamiltonian. And here I use a uh, symbol uh, nuclear. This is the Easter egg. Uh, so uh, what might be the symmetry that we might be imprinting? Well, uh, the natural symmetry is the total number of electrons. It's fixed. Or a model system, let's say, uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian uh, and is represented with the trace of the these excitation operators. So we choose H tilde to be the electronic Hamiltonian plus any operator V times this number of electrons minus its eigenvalue. So now you can see that if you act with this operator on an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. HL, this part is zero because this is an eigen state of n as well with this eigen value. Uh, so everything's all right. And now you can, if you have the choice mm -hmm. as to this operator B, well, uh, you might propose a, a suitable form that will do the task, do the job. And uh, Gleiser and is my work, Toronto, uh, they proposed the following form for me. Uh, that there is some number plus linear combination of these excitation operators. Remember that these are the creation annihilation operators. And when you plug it in here, you'll be able to re-express this Hamiltonian H tilde the same way as the electronic Hamilton group before. So now there will be new matrix elements uh, that correspond to the one body terms, and new matrix elements correspond to two body terms. So G uh, is the old G plus some function of these parameters. Uh, similarly, H is the old H plus some function of these parameters. And uh, bear in mind that these tensor, so rank four tensor, has to obey some symmetries due to uh, uh, symmetries in the integrals. So, so uh, these symmetries will, are also imprinted in here. Uh, so we are dealing with such a phenomenon. And what we could do, we could find parameters, uh, psi, pq, and kappa, uh, at lower than norm. But we went to that version and said, well, you can also decompose this tensor G, which contains O of n to the power of four terms, roughly, n to the power of four divided by eight, uh, and express it mm -hmm. as sum of products of lower rank tensors, rank two, uh, and truncate this expansion. Uh, similarly, you can do uh, something like that with uh, matrix. Uh, and this, uh, the best way to do it is through eigen decomposition. So you take matrix element HPQ and represent it as a sum of products, eigenvalues, and some vectors, which constitute a projector on the subspaces. Uh, so here we have one more step because we've got rank two. So let's go to rank one by another decomposition and truncation. So now we have fewer terms, let's say, that are relevant. We can just cut off some low eigenvalues. Uh, and 
then you can calculate the L1 markets, right, for these operators, this guy and this guy. Uh, and now we have this truncation parameter, so we the norm will be lower because uh, T is usually smaller than N, uh, where N is the number of orbitals. And now we have to believe me, I guess, that uh, it's a little bit of algebra to discover that the overall norm uh, that enters the quantum phase estimation is just such a function of these two norms. Uh, so now we have all the ingredients. We can formulate an optimization problem, uh, find kappa, the symmetric matrix sign for these parameters, and all n by n symmetric matrices a0 to a n minus 1, I remind you, this, these are these matrices. And under the constraint that this decomposition is good, so we don't make much error. We can try to control this error. And you want to minimize this norm. Mm. And this norm has been written before in this form, another Easter egg uh, to discuss about the norms. Uh, so this is the optimization problem. And Conrad wrote a brilliant code for um, finding optimal values for these uh, size, kappa, and matrix elements or elements of these matrices. Uh, and in our cases, this solves around 1 million parameters. And what was the size n you used in your computations? Uh, 108 and 160. Yeah. So this is my next slide, exactly. Uh, we need to pick a system. We need to pick a system, and these are two systems, uh, two target molecules that arguably are, are relevant. Uh, and one of them sits in a protein that allegedly converts nitrogen into ammonia in living organisms. Uh, it's a nitrogen fixation uh, protein, and FEMOCO is a molecule that is an active center down there. So this is the hard bit. We want to understand it, uh, how it functions. Can we design such catalysts for nitrogen conversion to ammonia uh, for a good reason, because uh, I think fertilizer production and this conversion mm -hmm. in the water process mm -hmm. takes up to 3% of global energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the grand goal is to design better catalysts to do it without the wash cover process. Uh, so we would like to calculate the ground state for now uh, of such a molecule. And we chose a model that has 54 electrons and 108 spin orbitals, and this is to n, this is to n, so, so uh, n will be 50, 54 as well. Uh, we also chose another structure, which is a structure in the cytochrome P450, and this is a, a widespread uh, enzyme in living organisms, all energy distribution, cellular, cellular metabolism uh, is steered by this thing, uh, including ketamine metabolism. Loads of stuff is related to this cytochrome. You would like to uh, be able to, to calculate energy levels for it and its orbitals. So it's got 63 electrons and uh, 58 uh, uh, orbitals. So if you wanted to calculate the energy levels of such molecules, the size of the Hilbert space, so for full configuration interaction Hilbert space, it's way bigger than 10 to the power 31, so it's out of the question. Uh, and we're not aiming at any such computation, but uh, it shows that they are classically hard. Uh, and here are our results. So we took FEMOCO and P450. Here are the number of orbitals. Here's the truncation parameter from tensor of rank 4 to east tensor of tensor is rank 2. Uh, you might remember, I'll, I'll go back because it's important. This is the two body tensor into these smaller bits. This is M. And we chose M to be 6 times M. And here are several methods. Uh, and we care about the norm. So the method called XDF is the original double factorization method. Uh, let's say first, first work, quite recent. Uh, 
And there's also new, newer, newer works on uh, on this topic, which which claim to 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 squeeze a lot out of it. And Conrad uh, found out that uh, how enormous, at least twenty five percent lower, uh, while keeping the error at the same level. Uh, error of this expansion. Uh, so we, we, we call Ning now a handsome algorithm that, uh, let's say, is more frugal in resources than others uh, as of today. Um, sorry, can, can I ask about error? Uh, yes, that's sorry. perfect. So, because uh, those errors refer to are errors of your truncations in those, yes. like, of zero mathematical objects you have along the way. So my, my question is, do you control the error, the corresponding error in implementation of the actual algorithm? Because it might be like, you know, challenging to keep track, like how errors propagate, or it's, let's say, the state of the art metric that people use in this context. In your mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this error first is uh, no less that than the norm of the original uh, rank four tensor and the approximate one. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, let's say, we, we don't have a really good understanding how it translates into errors in quantum algorithm. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, in order to do that, people have been trying to, there's no good, there's no consensus how to do it. And people are trying to calculate uh, energy level, the end goal. So the, the eigenvalue is some nice method, state of the art method, and compare to the simulation done with uh, this truncation. Uh, but there's there's no very good protocol for that. So, uh, so here we come to the last bit. I'll check the time. How much time do I have? Uh, I'll say. You are saying okay. since there were some questions, I would say uh, 15 minutes. That's perfect. 15 minutes, if okay. You want. That's going to be good. So uh, now about applications. So we would like to, so everybody's talking about calculating the eigenvalues of the electronic Hamiltonian. Uh, we asked uh, a broader question, like, can we, can we model something more? Or like not the electronic Hamiltonian alone, but just go a little bit beyond. And the poly break Hamiltonians watch one such Hamiltonian, which includes relativistic effects. Uh, and a little bit of context. Uh, what 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 this poly break Hamiltonian refers to? Well, a sip of water. So uh, for example, you might have a situation where your system is excited by a photon and it starts with a singlet state, electronic singlet state, and it's being excited to some higher singlet state. And these singlet states are might be coupled, in fact, to the so-called triplet electronic states. Uh, and this mechanism for coupling of these two different spin multiplicity states is called the inter-system crossing or inter-system coupling. Uh, and this is steered by the spin orbit coupling, which is part of the poly break Hamiltonian originates from uh, relativistic uh, perturbation assumption. Uh, so it controls much of chemistry, uh, organic chemistry, automaterial design, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And somewhat against common knowledge, the spin orbit coupling or this crossing is not reserved for heavy atoms. Sometimes it might be relevant even for light atoms. Mm. We might take it a bit further and say, if we were able to model this inter-system crossing well, we could try to design molecules that serve our purposes. For example, uh, just one of the examples, photodynamic therapy, where you take a molecule and excite it with photon and through inter-system crossing, the molecule goes from a singlet state to a triplet state. And while in the triplet state, it collides with oxygen, triplet oxygen, and it produces something called the singlet oxygen, which is 
uh, a reactive mm -hmm. species and it scales cells. This is cancer cells. Uh, so if you were able to have in nature design more efficient photosynthesizers or materials that produce this oxygen through this mechanism, then you could improve uh, some therapies. Uh, so that's one, one motivation uh, for, for doing such calculations. Another is our uh, attachment of oxygen to heme in our blood. So uh, process fundamental life is spin forbidden. Hence, it must be controlled by the spin orbit coupling. We would like to understand it. And it's big molecule and half. Um, some chemical reactions are steered by the strength of the spin orbit coupling. And there is experimental evidence for that. Uh, and last but not least, I would say, uh, there's been a report by the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which listed, uh, let's say, areas where quantum computing might be uh, truly useful. Uh, and one of these areas is in so-called artificial photosynthesis. Uh, so you might, we might try to mimic nature and say, I want to take water and CO2 and convert it into something useful like hydrocarbons uh, or sugar. Uh, and for that, I need catalysts. And these catalysts usually contain heavy atoms or they, they, they must be uh, treated relativistic. So uh, that's why polyabrate Hamiltonian might be relevant. Uh, and here it is. So it consists of six terms. It's the electronic Hamiltonian plus two other terms. So this is the old non-relativistic electronic Hamiltonian. And here we have a cartoon which shows that we've got eta electrons and m nuclei, and there are distances between the, the lowercase r, these are the electrons, and uppercase r, these are the nuclei. Uh, but in addition to that, we've got the so-called one and two-body Darwin terms. Uh, not diving into details, but because it's irrelevant to the discussion, but I'm listing mm -hmm. How, uh, what's the, what the body counts for them? That's, that's relevant. And where spin enters. The other terms, so HSO1 and HSO2, are the so called spin orbit coupling terms. Uh, and they include these spin operators attached to a given electron and also angular momentum uh, operators. So, spin orbit is in fact a two body operator. Uh, commonly, it's, it's represented as one body approximation, but in fact, it's two body. Uh, and there's also spin spin, which is much weaker uh, interaction due to this inverse bit power dependence on the distance. So, this is uh, how, how the polybrate kind of thing looks like. Um, now, what we could do with this Hamiltonian is to convert it into second quantized form. So we again choose the orbital basis as before, uh, the Lade operators, the excitation operators, and we convert textbook uh, into, into a second quantized form where the matrix elements, the one body part and the two body part now depend on spinning explicitly. Um, and now it's gonna be a little bit uh, of a flow of information. Uh, so what you could do, you could in fact convert these operators expressed with E with something called the triplet excitation operators. If you take a linear combination of these original excitation operators with coefficients that are elements of poly matrices, you form a rank one tensors uh, and they, they obey exactly vector commutation rules uh, with spin operator. Uh, you might express the Hamiltonian with these. Uh, and you might also write them in a more compact way just through these, ex through these uh, triplet excitation operators where we just introduce a, a column vector that corresponds to these components of the poly matrix. And a zero poly matrix is identity. Um, 
here's the two body parts. There's no, it's a bit more complex, but the, pun, the, the punchline is that it's a quadratic form of these triplet excitation operators, and there's a matrix inside. Uh, so you might sum it up at, upon converting to this new representation. Uh, you express the one body term and the two body term in terms of the triplet excitation operations. This is just, just a little detour. <clears throat> now, the, the, the key goal is to uh, do something called block encoding of the simultaneum, because eventually we want to get to learn about the eigenvalence of it. So, in order to do so, I need to prepare some grants. And what we did, uh, actually, it's been done in, in the previous work, but we followed this work, uh, is that we switched to something called the Majorana representation. The Majorana representation. Uh, is, is given by two operators, which are sort of canonical operators. They are linear combinations of these creation annihilation operators, and they are Hermitian and anti-commuting, and they uh, uh, they obey these anti-commuting rules essentially. They have nice, nice properties, and when uh, you switch to this my runner representation, so you start with this form of let's say one body term now. Uh, and I can compose the matrix elements of the one body term. So you uh, do an eigen decomposition on that into eigenvalues, eigenvectors, these are the projectors, this rank one matrix. When you do that, you plug it in, you end up with a linear combination of products of minor run operators, uh, which are uh, which are actually. So, so these guys are already unitary, and this is the nice thing. So uh, as you might anticipate, we want to express the Hamiltonian as a linear combination of unitaries uh, for the purpose of block encoding. Uh, so uh, we switch to my runner. We define new operators. They've got an index L, and index L is the index that's corresponding to the eigen decomposition of these matrix. Uh, the one body matrix we've got index oh, sorry we've got index mu, which are the Cartesian components that all the matrices, sigma, which is the spin, and x, which identifies which uh, my run operator it is a zero type or one type, so zero type one type, and these are uh, if this is a unitary uh, operator and this is a unitary operator the product is also unitary, uh, so. Now, a few words about block encoding. Uh, assume that you expressed your Hamiltonian as a linear combination of unitaries. So uj is unitary, and you've got some coefficients. Uh, then the block encoding of this Hamiltonian into a unitary circuit might be depicted by that very schematically, that we have a bigger unitary matrix. And in the top left corner of it, You've got H, uh, which is somewhat a simplification, but uh, punchline is that if you measure a certain bit string, uh, you effectively act with this operator on arbitrary state. What is the ratio between this blue square, square and big square? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's related to the norm uh, of this of this Hamiltonian. Uh, so so you know, we might imagine that there is uh, it depends on the norm. So if H was, or, or how far from unitarity H is. So if H would, was unitary, it would expand the whole view, of course. And, uh, uh, and then the norm for H would be one. Uh, so the, the further away from one the norm is, I think uh, the smaller the bit here is, or the lower the chance for measuring it is. The object needs to ramp it up to boost this probability. It's called amplitude amplification. Uh, but yeah, ideally, we would like to have something as close to unitarity as possible. So, you want to keep the size of u as small as possible, fixing h? Uh, I would say keep the size of h. Uh, yeah, yes, that, uh, from that perspective, true. So, you could sit on the edge of h and just try to shrink it uh, somehow. But I don't, I don't know how, how to do it. Uh, in practice, yes. So, uh, uh, 
if you had one term in this expansion, that would be an ideal scenario. That would exactly. So we'd like to reduce the number of terms. So the size of this difference, I think it's proportional to uh, the number of terms. Uh, so in principle, can be up to d square, right? What is d? Well, well, when the d is the dimension of the unit term. Uh, yeah, so it's four to the power of n. Uh, and this procedure, so how to place it there, can be realized with three operators or product of three operators, up, us, up dagger. And what these operators do? First, you need to create a superposition of states with coefficients that are square roots of these a's here. And you've got some register that runs from one to n. So it might be done on log n qubits. Uh, and in the middle, we've got this us, it's called the select unitary. And you say, uh, control on the value of this index executes uj. And when you combine these, uh, you might write them in the form of a quantum circuit as well. So you might say that this block encoding is exactly up, us, and up dagger. So this is just kind of the schematic representation of, of uh, this transformation. Uh, and what you do at the end, you measure this top register and hope for the best that you measure zeros, if you measure zeros, uh, you execute it H on uh, in the bottom register. Uh, so by and large, this is how block encode works. And now we would like to block encode our function, so our our the great function. So the way it looks, let's let's have a look at the one body part first. So we arrive at this form. So it was a sum over L, the eigenvalue decomposition, and I replaced this product of lowercase gammas with uppercase gamma. Uh, so this is unitary. So this is an LCU form. And if it's an LCU form, linear combination of unitaries, you might write the circuit for block encoding as we learn from this uh, let's say educational part. And uh, because we've got indices L mu sigma rho, there should be L mu sigma rho in this control, in this select part. Uh, and uh, as uh, you might anticipate, we've got two n qubits for the system register. Because we've got two n orbitals. Uh, and just going ahead, uh, what we've done is we propose block encoding for that, and also how to do it efficiently. So how to remove the spin variable from the control, the overall coupled control, and this is roughly due to the analytic formulation of the poly matrices. Poly matrices are inherently uh, quantum, uh, they, they uh, comply with quantum quite well. So, so uh, if you can express your coefficients as elements of the poly matrices, it's, there's probably a, a simple circuit that can do it, that can implement their values. Uh, so in order to, to do it, so in order to do block encoding, we first first need to, to uh, uh, do qubit encoding because we haven't said a word about that. So we need to order our bases. So this, this, are, this is the spin orbital basis. First index are orbitals. Second index is spin, spin down, spin up. And we want to do the traditional rodan Wigner transformation. So we replace uh, the annihilation operators with a tensor product of Z up to the index of this orbital. Uh, and at, at the index, we leave a uh, sigma plus uh, operator. Uh, so when we do this, you might express these products of these Majorana operators also with uh, poly matrices. There's a procedure for that. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the lesson is that there are some Zs, there's a string of Zs, and it's sandwiched in, in between some flicker operations. Uh, so I, I think due to time constraints, I'll skip uh, the part how we prefer the state. 
is uh, we might talk about it in, in a moment. Uh, but I would like to focus on the select part. Uh, so uh, remember, we've got this one body term for now, and we've got the select operator. And the select operator in, let's say, uh, human language uh, looks like that. So it's a collection of controls. All these indices are here, and they must be here. And this top, this bottom operator acts on the system register. So this is select as we learned. And now there's, uh, let's say, a collection of transformations that we have to do in order to uh, implement it efficiently. So first, because this is unitary, we can always decompose it into some uh, some other matrices or do a decomposition of it. And these Ws are also unitary. There are many ways of doing that. Uh, and these Ws are also products of some smaller, uh, smaller, uh, uh, smaller unitaries. And in order to to catch in the zoo, what's like what what's the what's the point? What's the certain center point here? So we produce linear combinations of my runner operators. And the coefficients were the elements of the eigenvectors in the decomposition of this uh, of this uh, Hamiltonian H one body. So we produced such a linear combination. We said this linear combination is unitary because if in fact it is, uh, and we can replace this linear combination as sum with a product of, of uh, three matrices. And then we just plug it in here, go back, go back, and and assemble this operation. Uh, and these unitaries are defined over the space of all spin orbitals, and they can be decomposed in into something called the Gibbons rotations. Uh, and Gibbons rotation is uh, just an exponent of some angle. And some generator. Usually, it's y rotation in some space. Uh, so, so these guys can be decomposed into given rotations, and the given rotation. So, if you've got an operator of this type, and this is just some qubit operator, you can always also decompose it into an arbitrary single qubit z rotation and two Clifford operators. Uh, and this is quite quite important for efficient implementation of that. Uh, so there's there's a sequence of steps you have to do uh, to, to 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 arrive at that uh, at that point. And uh, in the language of quantum circuits, your select operator uh, is expressed through controlled operations W. W is this. So we go down. Uh, each such W operator is uh, produced uh, by a sequence of these given rotations, which are in, in fact decomposed into Clifford uh, arbitrary rotation Clifford, Clifford arbitrary rotation Clifford. And there's a chain of these going down to all the orbitals. Um, and how do we implement all tolerantly a controlled arbitrary RZ rotation? Well, one way is to use quantum dictionaries. So uh, imagine this is just, just controlled RZ rotation. What you do, you need to load the data about the angle about which you want to rotate into something called quantum dictionary. Uh, and then when you do that, you perform a sequence of, of fixed angle uh, RZ rotations, inverse powers, Two, uh, and in order to maintain the control of over the accuracy, you have to stop at some precision of these angles, and we uh, so we must define some precision. This precision is beta, uh, and the number of these operations is exactly beta here. Uh, so this part, in fact, is the most time and, and gate-consuming part in the quantum algorithm. Uh, takes up to 60% of all gates. And we've devoted quite a lot of effort to uh, 
Thank you, Peter. And our uh, brilliant Koshinagi from the Toronto team uh, published a paper on that quite recently, so I refer you to his brilliant work. Uh, and this is sometimes people call it the QRAM or QROM uh, quantum memory, quantum RAM. It's really, really relevant here. Uh, so, uh, so when you do that and you write gates, uh, you write, uh, write your circuit into elementary gates, so for T gates and different gates, uh, you just estimate how many of them you need in the end and you can do it. Uh, people have done it. Uh, but this is just the one body operator. You have to do a similar procedure for the two body, but uh, I, I will just go skip over that. There's a procedure called the qubitization. You, you, have, to, you have to go, uh, you have to do block encoding twice, let's say, uh, and eventually you arrive at that. And the last bit, so, so far there was nothing new. I mean, uh, it was just a known framework applied to, a, let's say, New Hamiltonian, uh, but we haven't told uh, anything about, haven't said anything about how to do it efficiently. And how to do it efficiently? Well, one way is to remove the spin dependence uh, from uh, from these W operators. And uh, uh, the way it's done, mm -hmm. the way it's done are uh, is through something called the spin swap networks. Uh, I think it would take a little bit too long to uh, explain every detail, so I'll, I'll be happy to maybe cover it a bit later or uh, during the coffee break. Uh, mm, but the, the point is that with a choice of simple swaps on qubits, you might remove the dependence on spin in the select part, you would have to do four such things. And now you remove it and you just control states that are created, uh, that are, let's say, defined by these poly matrices uh, with these uh, swap networks. And instead of having four, you in fact have like one of these. So it's like a fourfold uh, reduction due to that with a transformation that costs nothing from the perspective of all tolerant algorithm because swaps or even controlled swaps are cheap. Uh, so this brings me to some conclusions. Uh, first conclusion is that we demonstrated the procedure for block encoding on uh, the folly breaks Hamiltonian and we showed how to uh, let's say a roadmap how to calculate the energy levels of this uh, Hamiltonian uh, using some tensor factorizations and my runner representation. And we also used symmetries uh, of the electronic Hamiltonian and some tensor compositions to reduce the norm of uh, the electronic Hamiltonian for uh, relevant molecules by up to 25%. Uh, and with this, a uh, big thanks to my colleagues, Konrad, Deka, Janek, to uh, Obietke and Vitek Jarnitsky for the excellent uh, mathematical support. Uh, uh, big thanks also to the funding body. This, this project is funded by the EIC grant. Uh, and the last word is that uh, we are constantly hiring uh, both in Poland and Canada. Uh, thank you for staying with me and for your attention. Thank you. So, uh, we had some questions on the way, but maybe. A couple of questions uh, now, Carol. Yes, well, I will have some technical questions about Hamiltonian eigenvalues. I will uh, pose them later on. But now I have one general question. You mentioned that you had some uh, American grant, which I call it grant patent. Oh, we submitted. Yes, I will submit. So, but now I'm submitting. So, the question is how to convince some officers of the patent office that this is what you are doing uh, should be patented, <laughs> or that it may be usable for something. Because it's going to be public, I, I won't say that it's easy. Uh, so you don't have to claim that they don't do a review, like right? well, peer review papers. I think they check for obvious prior art. And uh, if somebody has done mm -hmm. something very similar to your figure, not if it in any way, or there's, there's a. So you can prove that this is new. Somehow. This is new, innovative, 
And that's enough for me. Exactly. Yes, yes. So, and what are the costs of such a procedure, if I may ask? The order of magnitude tend to some power. So I don't have exact data, and I might be wrong by an order of magnitude, yeah. but my guess is uh, it's in a few thousands of dollars. In terms of four. Yeah, three, uh, but but on, on the uh, end close to 10 to the power of four, I guess. Yeah. I might be wrong. Uh, see, uh, Conrad is our chief patent officer, and he knows the thing. Yeah. Okay, um, maybe there is... Someone no online? No, no questions. So, Oliver, please. I have a very naive question because I, I don't really understand this stuff at all. So, right at the start, you sketched a procedure for doing using mm -hmm. quantum phase estimation to confuse eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Right. So, my vague understanding so, of yeah. using eigenvalues is expected to be very hard, so, even if you fact that it's a false one. Like it's QA. Yeah, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. is it so, mm -hmm. I don't, there's some contention between these two, like, I don't really understand. Mm -hmm. So, there's one unknown to me in your question. What does it mean, very far? Uh, QMA difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so, exponentially so complex on a quantum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, this is the case. I, uh, so, so, using grand state energies, at least, is QMA difference. Uh, is it? Quite a lot of problems, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not very, not directly obvious, but. Uh, so, if you have a two body operator, and you use quantum phase estimation, uh, and you, you set a precision for your eigenvalue. Uh, you have a certain probability of measuring it. Uh, perhaps if you want to do it uh, in, in accurately. No, I think to relative precision. Because that would mean that quantum computing is doomed. Well, it would mean the quantum computing can't solve this particular problem, but it can. There may be many experts uh, on, uh, in the classroom that you will, will uh, explain better than me, but I, I don't think this. Let's uh, maybe postpone it for, for later. We have one more question for Mr. Rozewski. To the classical computers and classical methods, there's a huge body of, of, of uh, algorithms that are designed just to find the ground state, the lowest energy state, not some arbitrary excited states. Is that area completely separately approachable with the help of quantum computing? Mm -hmm. Going beyond ground state is... Uh, no, no, just ground state. I believe, yes, right? So, so uh, because uh, we, we, we show how many gates you need in order to calculate an eigenvalue, the ground state of the Hamiltonian, uh, for a given Hamiltonian yeah. at a given position. So if I know that, uh, I think this is all that. Yeah, I understand, um, but your method seems to be of course much more powerful because that could also uh, give you access to the excited state. Exactly. And but what you need, of course, it's a great thing, but what I'm saying is that at the classical level, much more can be learned about the ground state than about the excited states. So perhaps that was my guess, maybe wrong, that also on the quantum computing level, there could be some area of algorithms that are designed specifically for the ground state. Mm -hmm. I don't think quantum phase estimation is that rigid. I mean, depending on the overlap of your trial state, yeah. uh, it, it might give you any eigenvalue. The problem yeah. begins when the density of the eigenvalues grows exponentially with the index. There's too many eigenvalues per resolution. Uh, then you might think to sample it so far yeah. to uh, you end up with... On the other hand, of course, the usually the ground state is gapped. Yes, and that makes things easier for you. Even also in, in terms of eigensolvers for, for classical computing, yes. Uh, yes, but what you can do, you can define something called filter functions that boost the probability or shift the Hamiltonian to a given spectral window yes. and loop for eigenvalues down there. So, so there are there are procedures, but they are there's an extra overhead associated with this over the ground state quantum phase estimation. Yes, uh, it's an interesting path, and we're following it now. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, 
Uh, I suggest we start here. Emil is with us today and I understand at least a bit tomorrow. Yes. So uh, let's thank Emil again for his time.